Well, hello, you bearded bastards, and welcome back once again to Locum Cor Zugabra Lokukun Obak, Spear Cavern, the Grand Granite Shrine of Pillars. At the current moment, it's the 25th of Timber, late autumn of 139, which means at this current juncture, we've been here for 23 years. Pretty darn impressive to have such a small population survive for this long. Of course, there's been ups and downs along the way, but well, we're not just surviving, we are thriving today. And on that note, I think it's time we opened up our tavern to the wider world. Our tavern named the Cobalt Room. That's right, we didn't want to let that name die. Though it is a shame we don't have anything made out of uh, cobaltite here in this room, like our lower tavern there. Remember Cobalt Room? We used it for a good many years. It was our, our central fortress area for a while, actually. We thought it would be nice to kind of bring that history up here. We should do more with it, though, shouldn't we? Anywho, I think we have about everything in place. I mean, <laughs> we're not going to have the drinks out. Not quite yet. We don't have a tavern keeper as well. Again, we're not too sure what to expect for faces from the outside world. If we get piled on immediately, I don't want people drinking all of our supplies. So, we'll, you know, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. How's that sound? Just a, a, a test run, a dry run. <laughs> Not too concerned. We'll just see who shows up and we'll go from there. I, I hope they like dogs, whoever does show up. Because, uh, yeah, we, we've got a few of them. Just thought, ooh, hey, before anybody shows up, could somebody go around and just polish up these statues a little bit? I think that'd be pretty nice. Yeah, yeah, we got these statues in here, these steel statues, all made by the crab. And each one represents one of our dwarves. Well, most of our dwarves, anyways. Our founding seven. Emmy doesn't have a statue yet. She'll earn one in time, but, you know, I figured... We should have a visible sign of respect and our history before any visitors show up. We want people to depart from here knowing our story and also seeing what we've been through. Bit of a passive history lesson. Of course, we have Tinny's statue up front. That's going to be the first one anybody sees. It's a statue of her in 116, being appointed expedition leader of the Garish Pillars here. That's our name. We don't use it that much. It's our, our formal name of our group. But yes, it's a, a nice statue of her just surrounded by the other dwarves, just accepting her position graciously. That said, the nicest of these statues is over here. This one right here. Hmm, look at that, will ya? It's a statue of Pop and Vesifa. It was a watery forgotten beast that appeared quite some time ago. She went up and absolutely demolished the thing in a single hit. We probably don't even remember it. It was so quick. Just whoosh, splash, done. Really great work. Yeah, some other good statues there too. Looking good. Yeah, we are ready for visitors, aren't we? Excellent. Any second now, I'd imagine. All eyes are pointed towards our entrance ramp, which I'm very glad we finally got squared away. It's right up here to the north of our meeting hall. If we head down this tunnel right here past this nice cooling mist, we could see this ramp, which is, you know, we got some siltstone blocks on the floor here. This was just a temporary thing. We might change that at some point. But anyways, yes, we have this ramp that goes upwards. Quite a ways, too, all the way to the surface. There are some minor issues with it. I mean, it punches straight through our aquifer, and, like, th there is still some water getting in from... It's, I don't know, it's a whole thing, but it's plenty serviceable. And you can see this nice covered entryway up here on the surface too. We've got these four pillars here holding up a roof above. It's you know, just a flat roof. It's nothing too fancy, but it's going to keep the rain off of visitors when they start heading down, which is nice. Actually, this was just the beginning of a project. We wanted to kind of like make this roofed structure here go out a little bit farther. More pillars and more floor so we could put cage traps down just in case we get attacked by animals or, you know, anything tries to scurry into our fortress real quick. Gonna be kind of an ugly mess if we have a bunch of visitors here and we get attacked by giant buzzards or something like that, you know. It's something to chew on. We'll come up with an idea in the future. For now, the dwarves are kind of tired of working. It's been a long eight years since we had our shake up there. Queen Bee has been working us very, very hard. You know, I did mention our dogs a while ago. Um, We went through this whole process. One of the big things we had to do, actually, was go through the process of sorting out our dogs. Like, we've long ago given up on the idea of trying to create our own fortress breed of fancy biter. Just too many other things to worry about. And so, like, we we went through and we took care of a lot of the dogs. We, we butchered them, okay? Uh, just to put it flatly, we... Butchered a lot of them, and we got an awful lot of nice leather and meat. But, I mean, as you can see, the population has bounced right back, and we're inundated with dogs once more. Same goes for the Drunians as well. We haven't really looked at our Drunian pen all that much, but it is just a flourishing ecosystem in there. Got a whole bunch of Drunians, and they seem relatively happy, actually, in just this strange, chaotic mess they're creating. They got their little pools of water in there, their little caverns in which they could take refuge. Yeah, they're not, they're not doing bad. But yes, we did go in there. We butchered a whole bunch of those guys too. And their leather, it's very nice. Very, very nice. I mean, it's got a stink to it, obviously. I mean, look at them, but it's warm. Insulates very well. Not very soft. It's not soft at all. It's, it's kind of wiry, but it keeps you warm. Still, 
in a utilitarian sense, highly valuable. Don't want to take all day talking about Drunians, but it is a bit of a passion of the crabs. And he really likes coming down here and just looking out his fortifications and taking notes. Very, very, very detailed notes on the Drunians. It seems that these days their leader is one that he has dubbed Ponder, a 14-year-old female and granddaughter of one of the original Drunians we had here in Spear Cavern. She's been a very good leader of the troop. There hasn't been nearly as many disembowelings or maulings as when Gouji was the alpha. Good to see. Keeps the noise levels down in here. Anywho, back out here to the Cobalt Room, still waiting for visitors. I mean, I know we have our gates open. We mentioned it to the merchants when they were here last. We haven't talked about the merchants in quite some time. And that's because we haven't been trading with merchants for quite some time, even before that eight-year time jump there. We're pretty self-sufficient here at this point. We have everything we need. That said, maybe we could pick up something from those merchants. Maybe they'd be more, uh, willing to spread word of our little fortress here. Guess it couldn't hurt. We'll have to cook up something. Also, another very cool idea is we could actually have those merchants come straight down to Spear Cavern now. Our entry hall is plenty wide enough, so yeah, they can come straight down. We should make a little depot room for them, probably better than that little swamp hole they've been setting up in. More safe, too. Yeah, you know, that would be a good idea. Do some trading, get in good with the mountain home, you know. Maybe with those humans, too, they could spread word of our cobalt room. Hmm, yeah, that'd be a good idea. We'll plan something up. And actually, on that same subject, I think... Uh-oh. What was that? Let's have a look. Okay. All right, we got some bad news here. Real bad news. I'm not sure what's going on exactly, but Wisp, who's in a very, very bad mood all the time now, is in a particularly bad mood at the moment and is throwing a tantrum over here in her bedroom. I, um, this is unusual behavior from her. We have not seen her do this before, but it's understandable. She's been through an awful lot as we all have. We're trying our best to make her happy, but it's clearly not doing enough for her. What do you do? What can you do? There's not much. I mean, you can see her bedroom here is when she's got her pet Druni in on a steel chain, and she's got her, it's a, it's a pet moth in a cage. Very nice accoutrements for a dwarven bedroom, for sure. But yeah, it, it's not doing enough for her. I'm glad she's keeping this tantrum relegated to her bedroom at the moment. This sort of rage is very unusual for her, though. And it's a devastatingly bad sign, too. I'm not too sure what we can do about it, though. Send her away? Out of the fortress? I'm not sure that'd be an option. She'd have to make that great journey all the way back to the mountain homes. That's a week's travel at least. Well, I mean, as long as she doesn't bring this rage out of her room, then she could stay here as long as she wants. I just... Uh, we love Wisp. We don't want to lose another one. Especially not like this. I'm thinking maybe we should get that Drunian out of there, though. I would hate for her to lose her temper too badly and start beating that poor thing, huh? Yeah, we'll let her simmer down and then we'll pull that guy out of there. Man, poor Wisp. Anywho, still no visitors here in the Cobalt Room. A little disheartening, but I suppose we should have patience, shouldn't we? I guess we shouldn't have expected a huge number of faces to pop up here in the far north wilds, in the middle of the Swamp of Brightness nonetheless with a horrible titan right outside our gates. Yeah, I mean, hospitable isn't exactly the word for this location. Exotic, maybe. Adventurous, definitely. And so yes, we will be patient, probably for the best. In the meantime though, we have our dwarves heading downstairs, far, far, far downstairs, in order to take some cobaltite from the cobalt room that Pop has freshly mined out and get it hewn into blocks that we're gonna take back upstairs into the cobalt room and place down on the floors. I think that'd be a rather snazzy touch and probably will get rid of some of the questions too about the cobalt tie and where is the cobalt? Why is it called the cobalt room? Well, there you go. It'll be a pretty good idea. We want to avoid those questions getting annoying and you know, it's oh, a visitor. Dwarves to the cobalt room. Let's go. Goodness gracious. Would you look at this? It's a goblin or it was a goblin at one point. Uh, hello. Hello. And welcome to Spear Cavern and to the Cobalt Room. Please make yourself comfortable. Hmm. Okay. Got an interesting look to him. Not that we're judging, just exotic. You know, we don't get too many new faces here, especially not a uh, undead goblin monster slayer like Erdem here. And uh, wow, is he a muscular one. Tall, too. Very tall. Ah, uh, yes. Well, uh, again, welcome. Please. Get as comfortable as you can. I mean, he seems to be enjoying the company of our dogs right now. Well, that's good. Scrap, you behave yourself. Okay, be a good girl. Don't crawl all over the guy. There you go. Good girl. Okay. Uh, we gotta get our dwarves up here. Out of the mines. 
We want to talk with this guy. See what brought him to Spear Cavern. Very curious about that. Okay, yes, here we go now. We have a bunch of dwarves in here now, just relaxing and seeing to Erdem's needs, greeting our visitor. All this while Erdem is weaving us a tale, an interesting tale of a human necromancer named Akath named Breaches, becoming the warlord of the Tufted Blades in the year 88. A harrowing bit of an adventure story there, I guess. Fascinating. Now, at this point, we have spoken to Erdem just a little bit, and apparently he's here just to relax. He heard that the Snack of Irons was a place to enjoy oneself, and that was the name of our old tavern for us dwarves. A bit of a name switch there, I guess. It's the Cobalt Room now, Erdem. Make sure to tell your friends about us, please. We'd love to have more visitors like yourself. Finding out just a little bit more about our visitor here. Well, it seems that Erdem originally hailed from the Lucid Kingdom, which is a human empire far, far, far to the south. A human kingdom that we dwarves have not had contact with. Ah, and it would also appear that the, uh, the Tufted Blades, you're a member of that group, too. That's the group that the, uh, Necromancer Warlord became leader of in 88, huh? Okay, that, uh, that's a little suspicious there. But, you know, why judge a book by its cover? Just because you're a goblin Deathstalker who came here on behalf of a group led by a Necromancer Warlord doesn't mean much, right? It's probably fine. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about it. That said, we are starting to get a little bit suspicious about our guest here. We'll keep eyes on this one, I suppose. I mean, you know, it's all fun and games to open up a tavern to the wider world, but dangers could also creep in pretty easily, I would think. We don't want to be foolish about this, do we? Of course not. Gotta be safe. But for now, though, Erdem seems like a completely wonderful fellow. Oh my goodness. Another bit of news here. <laughs> it looks like we've had a marriage in our fortress. A spontaneous wedding has just taken place, and all the dwarves are celebrating. That is just wonderful to see. All the dwarves and our, our goblin friend there, too, who is singing right alongside the dwarves. Remarkable. It looks like Queen Bee has gotten married to Boggy. <laughs> Isn't that something? Huh. Hey, you'd think the crab and Queen Bee would be together, but no, that, that's not the case. Obviously, though, they have the crab's blessing, and the crab is here. Love to see it. We have Gutter here as well. Everyone's here except for Wisp who's off in her bedroom, and Pop, I'm not too sure where she is right now. Maybe doing some mining. She should really be around for this, though, shouldn't she? We do worry about those two. We definitely do. Well, congratulations, Queen Bee and Boggy, to a future of joy here in Spear Cavern. Gonna avert our gaze from the festivities up in the Cobalt Room for a moment. Just to have a look down here at Pop, we are concerned about her. She really has been in sort of a ragged mood since Tinny's death. Hard to blame her, too. Those two were very, very close. So she's just kind of been doing her work, tending to her own business, sticking to herself mostly. And it is sad to see because, I mean, she's part of our family. It's tough to see her go solo like this. It's been especially hard on Gutter, as you could imagine. These two are deeply in love. But with Pop being so distant, I mean, you have to imagine it does take a toll on him. That said, he has been keeping up a very stoic appearance in front of the other dwarves. He's the same Gutter we've always known. Smile on his face, always laughing. I really do hope that these two work things out in time. It would be nice. We're just going to take some more time to let them relax for a while. And... Oh, hold up one second here. Got some noise outside our walls. I'm sure it's nothing, though. Just the typical beast chatter. Uh-huh. Looks like at the north gate, we have a forgotten beast right now. Trying to take those doors down, but it's not going to get through. This one is Ustru. A gigantic swallow with external ribs. Poisonous vapors could be pretty bad, but we're not letting it in. It's been out there for a while now. We have lost track entirely of the beasts that have been showing up. Since we've locked ourselves away, it's been a hotbed of beast activity out there in the caverns. A real hot, too. Down here at the southern gate, we have another beast, actually. Akon, a huge quadruped composed of native copper. That could be a bad one, too. But again, it's not getting through our gates. There's no way. They've been trying for quite some time. I am confident they will hold. But yeah, you could see that mess out there. It is gross, and like, they just keep shifting out too. They'll come try to take down a door for a while, and then get distracted, go chase a beast off into the caverns or something. Maybe they just get bored. Sometimes they get killed by stronger beasts too. Yeah, things have been really quite active out there. But that's, that's okay. The activity could stay out there. We don't need that trouble these days. We're doing absolutely fine as we are. 
That was actually one of the first things that Queen Bee did when she became expedition leader. She wanted to get this part of the caverns locked away for us dwarves specifically. Tinny had commanded us to build a wall quite a few years ago, but we never got it finished. We got kind of lazy and distracted fighting beasts, but Queenie was able to see the writing on the wall. And it was a smart move too, now we have access to the caverns, so still have plenty of that fungus down there, plenty of stone, lots of forageables. It's worked out quite well for us. Although there is one little lingering issue. Not much of an issue, I suppose, but, well, it's down here. Galka, Galka, attack. The Forgotten Beast, remember that? <laughs> we locked this big bastard away with plans to make a coliseum or something like that, another of Tinny's half-baked plans. Idrath, bless her soul. That has been on the chopping block for quite some time, too. We would really like to do something with that idea. A coliseum, nothing, well, I mean, coliseum. The term conjures some grand images, doesn't it? But... If we did make something, it would have to be a bit smaller. You know, we're just a small fortress, but still, it would be a lot of work. It'd have to be, by its very nature. Just we have so few dwarves to work on it. We would like to keep undertaking some large projects, but we have so few hands. Of course, we have been tossing around some ideas regarding that. I know we're a small dwarven fortress. Our original plan was to come here with our seven dwarves, and that was going to be that. If they had children, so be it. Though, things have changed a bit, haven't they? Our population's hurting these days. We don't really want to go out whimpering, do we? Of course not. And if having Erdem, the goblin around, has taught us anything, it's that our dwarves are hungry for socialization. And so we were thinking of raising our population cap a little bit. Right now our population is seven dwarves. Formerly it was eight, of course. But what if we raised it just a little bit, up to ten dwarves? That'd be three more dwarves, maybe a tiny dwarven family or something. Might shake things up a bit, huh? It could really put us where we need to be. Gotta remember, too, our population may be seven, but one of our number is a child. Only 11 years old. It's gonna take another seven years to become a proper working dwarf. And then we also have poor Wisp, who can't grasp anything anymore. Her working days are over, unfortunately. And if we had more dwarves around, then there'd be more dwarves to socialize with her in her off time. Really, one of our main reasons for wanting to take in more dwarves is to have dwarves around to help Wisp. We are increasingly desperate to alleviate her woes in any way possible. And so we sent away word with the caravans last autumn that in addition to the cobalt room being open to the outside world, we have room for a couple more dwarves. So they should be arriving at some point, all the way from Northbridge. It'll be quite a trip for them. To think that Northbridge was originally established as a far northern colony for us dwarves. <laughs> I think we have them beat by quite a bit. Ah, uh, but yes, it will be nice to have some new faces here. And actually on that note, looks like we have a new visitor. Hmm... Looks to be a human, a monster slayer. Well now, come on in, come on in. Welcome to Spear Cavern and to the Cobalt Room. Mind the Titan, actually a little bit close there, but okay, I actually got a bit concerned for a moment. I thought the monster slayer was heading for Rofa, but no, he has gone around. Well, that's good. We might actually have to set up a wall out here, huh? Something, but that could be for the future. Anywho, hello. Make yourself right at home, my tall friend. Well, we can see that this human is certainly outfitted as a monster slayer, unlike Erdem the Goblin, who too is a monster slayer. This human here is outfitted with metal armor and also has a maul and a shield as well. A formidable presence. Marching right in and getting to know the dwarves. It appears his name is Stroha Thalatquem, and it looks like he's come here to relax as well. In the snack of irons, <laughs> much like... The goblin there, why is everyone under the impression this place is called the Snack of Irons? There must be a miscommunication with the merchants. We told them our place was open. That's a little vexing, but what are you going to do? Anyways, having a look here, it looks like Stroha is down here telling a story now. The story of how the goblin Smutsu grouped seduced became a representative of the rhyming councils in the early summer of 98. That's a boring story, but I suppose it must have some significance to this fellow. We don't know much about the rhyming councils, but it's probably some sort of human group, goblin group, perhaps. I'm not getting really skeevy vibes from this fellow yet, but we'll keep an eye on him. He could very well be a criminal too, I suppose. Not saying our goblin friend Erdem is a criminal for sure, but we would do well to remember that even though these stories might be interesting, the individuals telling them might have different motives. Regardless, the dwarves are happy. Yes, uh, prying a little bit more into Stroha here, it appears he's a former member of the Oceanic Realm, which is our neighboring human civilization, the ones who come to trade with us. Uh, and it looks like he may have held some pretty lofty positions within the Oceanic Realm too. He's the former Master of Beasts and a former Baron as well. Uh, also a former prisoner. It's, 
<laughs> it's very telling. We've got a telling story here. So he's part of this civilization. He gets all these lofty positions. Then he becomes a prisoner. And now he's a former member of that civilization. Okay. Okay. Yes, we will keep an eye on our friend here. But for now, seems quite an inoffensive fellow. Good to have you here. And I'm glad the dwarves actually get to listen to your stories now. They're off working for quite a bit of it. Uh, working up here on our new trade depot. And doesn't that look nice? It's made out of steel bars. Quite fancy, if I do say so myself. Unnecessarily so. Queen Bee even went around and put some nice engravings on the floor. And if we have a look up, you can see it's two Z levels tall. It gives us enough space in here. We'll joke with the humans and tell them it's because we thought they were so tall. <laughs> I'm sure they'll appreciate the humor. Uh, anywho, yes, we wanted to go a bit overboard on this design here just because we were thinking of maybe making Wisp our new broker. Traditionally, Gutter has been our broker, but we want to give some sort of a task to Wisp, and I think she could do this one completely fine. She hasn't always been the most social type, but this task shouldn't require all too much of her. She just has to pop in, seal the deal, and that'll be that. So, fingers crossed, this might work out pretty darn well. Still gonna put some statues or something in here, I think. That might be nice. By the way, Wisp is doing a little bit better than she was. Only a little bit, though. Regardless, it's a pretty good sign, I'd say. I have to think it's due to us having visitors here. A lot of the times when the dwarves are working, she's up here in the meeting hall all by herself, or rather with the dogs. But now, even when the dwarves are off working, she has people to interact with. Let's just keep hoping. I got a feeling things are gonna work out for Wisp. And maybe one day when we get some new dwarves here, things will improve even farther. The future is bright, Wisp. Just hang in there. There's a way forward through this. Oh, and speak of the demons. Coming in from the east right now, we have a couple more dwarves. Migrants come to live here at Spear Cavern. Looks to be a pair of them too. Oh, isn't that excellent? Come right down, you two. Good to have you. Isn't that something? It's a bit of a shock, frankly, to have two new faces here. <laughs> wow. Well, we should get to know our new friends, shouldn't we? Med Tob, the wax worker, and his wife, Stackhood, the miner? Well, isn't that excellent? A husband and wife. I'm sure they're gonna fit right in. Now then, first things first, we have to do something about your names. We kind of have this uh, unique naming convention going on here at Spear Cavern. We all have nicknames. And we know you've just arrived and we've only barely had a glance at you. But I think that's all we're going to need. Got a husband and wife, Medtob, a wax worker. We can already tell he's quite a lively individual. Incredibly energetic, maybe a bit anxious even. He's a bit wacky and he's a wax worker. So from here on out, you're going to be known as Wack. And that's going to fit perfectly because it appears that Stackhut already has a bit of a nickname. Uh, not a very clever one, but she's used to being called a stack. So, husband and wife, whack and stack, works out perfectly. Now, it's very good to have these two here. <laughs> Actually, we are uh, somewhat familiar with the pair of them. More stack than whack. Back at Northbridge, Stackhood was a, a little bit of a, a, a known figure. She has a bit of a history. She was part of an expedition a few decades ago up to the far northern reaches. And from what we understand, that uh, expedition was pretty failed. She was the only survivor of the original group. Something involving a cyclops. Uh, very intriguing that she decided to come here. Seems she's making the rounds. Up to the north, and then to North Bridge, and now here to Spear Cavern. A real rolling stone of a dwarf. Well, excellent. Good to have you here, my friend. Same goes for both of you. Yeah, would you look at that? Bunch of happy dwarves just milling about, telling stories, feeling better and better. And we still have one migrant spot, too. I wonder who's going to take that last space. Shouldn't be too, too long before we see another one. But I suppose we'll see. Anywho, dwarves, we have to get back to work. But whack, stack, you guys can have this room over here. That's right, we have an entire unused area. And I think you'll find it's quite to your liking. Much better than those cramped rooms on Northbridge. This here's a regular mansion. And actually, there's a little place outside, too. A pasture. There's a couple sheep in there. Those will have to stay there. But you can also, uh, I've noticed stack. You have a pet goat. Endoc is her name. And she's just a little baby still. One year old. Well, isn't she cute? Yes, she could stay out there. Completely fine. She appears to be rather shy at the moment, just kind of sitting in this corner. But I'm sure she'll come out in due time. Ah, there she goes. There you go. Just take a look around the place. Plenty to see. And don't worry, you're completely safe here, my friend. Or rather, you should be safe here. I'm not sure what that commotion is. Let's go have a look. Well, 
Well now, it looks like Stroha the Monster Slayer had other plans in visiting Spirit Cavern. We just happened to catch him out here trying to take down Rofa. Well, didn't really seem to work out too well for him. Serves you right, you bastard. That's what you get for trying to take down our Titan. Hoping that serves as a bit of a warning to those who come here trying to kill Rofa. It also makes me think we should get some sort of a protective barrier up soon. Rofa was not wounded in that fighting, but may become injured if we don't do something. Hmm. Yes, we'll begin putting some thought into that. Anyways, back to it for now, dwarves. Having a look down in the cobalt room, you can see things are advancing quickly. We have enough cobalt-type blocks to cover the floor, where those engravings were anyways, and it should end up looking pretty satisfactory in short order. Just gonna take a bit of doing, but now we have more hands to do the work, so it shouldn't be too bad. Also, if we have a look down here, you can see we have another visitor. It looks like our goblin friend, Erdem, has departed at some point, didn't see him leave. And our only visitor right now is this dwarf. It's a undead dwarf, and his name is Bomrek. He is a poet, and the type of undead that he is, is a uh, faded one. And he's come here to the Snack of Irons, not the Cobalt Room, to perform. Haven't really heard much of his poetry yet, though. That said, he's currently telling a story of how in the early summer of 50, the dwarf necromancer Domas Groupdors became the master of the blockaded buds. A group that he is a part of. Okay, so much like that goblin, um, Bomrek here appears to be associated with a group that is led by a necromancer. You know, it's a good thing these visitors have been entertaining so far, because we are getting some pretty bad vibes from most of them. <laughs> oh well. Again, entertainment is entertainment, we're just gonna have to keep eyes on them, eh? Another round of drinks, dwarves! Our guest is thirsty. <laughs> Please enjoy yourself. Oh, would you have a look here? It looks like the human merchants have arrived. Well, hello, my friends. Welcome back to Spear Cavern. We are looking forward to doing some actual trading with you this year in our new trade depot, our new steel trade depot down in Spear Cavern even. Yes, come right the hell in. Excellent. Okay, dwarves, we have to bring some stuff to the depot. Unfortunately, we have not really prepared anything uh, very interesting to trade, as per usual. But we do have a bunch of little spare knickknacks around, so maybe we could bring some of those in real quick. And Wisp, now is your time to shine. Get up there to the depot and do some brokering. We're counting on you. Good luck, my friend. Just, um, any old time you want to head on over there. Like right now would be nice. No? Okay, all right. Maybe just not feeling it or something, huh? We'll give you a moment. Well, they are gonna depart soon if we don't get our butt moving there, Wisp. All right, I'm not sure what's going on, but apparently she's not feeling this whole broker thing or something. It doesn't look like we're gonna be able to get Wisp into that trade depot, which is a damn shame. I was looking forward to that as uh, some way to maybe help her out a, a bit, but that has fallen through entirely. Ah, oh boy. Well, Gutter, if you could make your way over once again, please. Thank you. Don't want to leave these humans hanging again, do we? Oh, it looks like Erdem, our visitor, came back. The uh, undead goblin there, as well as... Uh, the hell are you? I mean, uh, welcome to the Cobalt Room. We have another goblin here, a goblin monster slayer. Not undead, which is good. Something that's not good, though, is that this goblin is completely naked, except for a book and a crown that appears to be made out of... Um, are those human fingernails? I believe so, yes. And your name is Aerith Squirtbook. Okay, cool. It looks like he came here to relax. I'm going to tell you what, though, Aerith, we're not too, too interested in having a look in your book. So just keep uh, that to yourself, please. Thank you. And enjoy yourself. Can we get a towel or something for Mr. Aerith? A uh, loincloth, perhaps, would be nice. I'll tell you, that wider world is a vivid tapestry. You never know who's going to show up. Goodness gracious. That said, the dwarves of Spear Cavern are in pretty high spirits these days. It's been a productive year. And although it's new for us, it's been very exciting, too. Intriguing. Our spirits are rising by the day. And when we think of the future, we can see only brightness. It will be brighter than the gold of Idrath, I tell you. Ah, Spear Cavern. May we live a thousand years and more. And with that, we're going to move on to talking about some behind-the-scenes things. That was an interesting episode. I really enjoyed it. Quite a bit. I'm feeling reinvigorated. 
I think that time jump in the last episode really did something for the fortress. You know, it was a time jump of eight years. And like, it was very quick to you guys watching, I'm sure. But like, you know, I, I had to sit there and play it. And while I'm playing, you know, I'm moving quickly, making decisions and stuff. But like, as time progresses, I'm able to like, wonder why the dwarves are doing things, I guess. Like, you know, we're very productive. And at this point, Queen Bee is our expedition leader. And so it just gives her a bit of character that I don't feel like she had before. She is a productive dwarf. The fortress was productive and she's the one who's leading everything. So it must mean she's very good at organizing people, right? Queen Bee is a dwarf who gets stuff done. And I love that. Also during this time, we get to see other things too, like uh, Pop's consistent upset mood. That makes me think too, like she only really came down with this mood, uh, like, I if you want to get technical, I don't think it's because of Tinny dying. Like, she's got a few things going on. But, like, it only really started to take off after Tinny died. So, I don't think it'd be a stretch to say that that sealed her terrible mood recently, right? The fact that her friend and fellow miner, Tinny, passed away. Makes me think of Poppin in a different way, too. Because before last episode, she was always kind of a bright and cheery dwarf. But now she's kind of dour. The kind of stinky thing with Dwarf Fortress is that, like, you're watching this or playing it from my perspective and your brain wants to make a narrative of it and you know we consume so much media so many different stories and whatnot over the years that we kind of expect arcs from characters but dwarf fortress doesn't give you that it's more realistic you know sometimes people just go downhill and stay there and narratively that's not always the most interesting or uh even fun thing to watch but i think in the grand scheme of things it does add something to it all. I kind of like to think of the narrative of the story being the fortress as a whole more than individual characters if that makes any sense. Like they're all part of this group and they all add their own touches to it. Just makes it more satisfying to me if I can look at it as a whole than at the individuals. Because like you know I gotta keep in my mind too like I, I've seen a lot of dwarves go downhill, stay downhill and then you know something bad will happen to them and they never recover. Or like a dwarf will start throwing tantrums because of their terrible mood. And again, you know, it kind of ruins the dwarf in my mind. Like, what if Wisp threw a tantrum and like killed Gutter or something like that? Could we look at Wisp the same? I don't think so. I think that would kind of like ruin a dwarf for me. A lot of the time there's no call for that sort of violence. Violence that could lead to the death of other people. I don't know, I'm, I'm getting kind of rambly here. Uh, back to Wisp though. I don't know, I really tried to get her to drop what she was doing and rather not drop she, she wasn't doing anything I was just trying to get her to go to the depot to trade but she just would not and i don't know why anybody else could do it i tried it with the other dwarves too and just wisp couldn't do it i have to assume it has something to do with uh her hands her she can't grasp anything so maybe a broker needs to be able to grasp things which seems a little scuffed i don't know it's a weird thing there was many calls after that last episode to um use df hack to restore her grip and I haven't used DF hack since the first episode of this series right here. And to be completely truthful with it, it kind of screwed up my save a little bit. We'll get into that in the future. Um, so I, I'm a little uh, concerned about that. But we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, on the, the subject of it screwing up our save a little bit, Stack Hood showed up in this fortress, right? And I will admit to you that I did a little bit of tinkering with that right there. Just with the mind that we have spots for three dwarves in the fortress i wanted to see somebody that we had seen in a previous fortress and i save the game an awful lot when i'm recording these i only play in short little bursts and i'm always sure to save it like after i'm done recording a, a given section and one of my saves was like the day of the migrant wave and i realized that if i reload that save it will randomize the dwarves who show up in the migrant wave and so i said to myself okay let's just uh roll the dice a few times here let's see if we can get somebody who we recognize and sure enough i only did it like five or six times and stack hud shows up with her husband nonetheless i guess she got married at some point <laughs> thought that was pretty cool but yeah we have stack hud now and one more slot remains too so we'll see who else shows up if anyone um but yes back to the screwing up my save thing with the df hack there Note that Stack Hood looks a bit different, and if I look at her appearance, she doesn't look anything like she used to at all. I think along the way, we kind of like lost all of that previous info, like the world info or something like that. And so like, um, like her little unit there, like the, like the image of her when we're playing the game, she has got different hair, and it's similar to the hair that she has now, but like uh, she's got a few other 
changes too, like her nose shape and whatnot. And I'm not, I'm not gonna do all that. Obviously there was some sort of a bug along the way, but I mean, I figure I could change her hair. Dwarves can change their hair, right? Like, like people. <laughs> not that it happens normally in Dwarf Fortress. Regardless, rambling, I don't regret rolling the dice and getting stack cut eventually. Very happy to see her, and I'm glad her story gets to continue a bit. And I am doubly glad that you are here to watch Spear Cavern today, and will be triply glad if you show up next time too, here in Locum Korzu Gabla Lokukun Obak, a Spear Cavern, the Grand Granite Shrine of Pillars. And until then, you bearded bastards.